Good evening, everyone. Tonight on What We're Learning, we have some special guests coming back to talk to us about a different era in history. You may remember them from their program, Swords, Myth vs. Reality, we hosted back in January. But Jerry and Natalie are back here to talk to us about Ireland and their various weapons and tactics that they used during the Renaissance. I'm very excited for you guys to join them on another fascinating journey through history. So without further ado, here are Jerry and Natalie in Renaissance Ireland, weapons, tactics, and mercenaries. Hi everyone, I'm Jerry. And I'm Natalie. And we're from the Swordsmanship Museum and Academy here giving you a very special presentation for the Kent District Library as a part of their Irish History Month. And of course, in the spirit of St. Patrick's Day, we are giving you a presentation about the weaponry and mercenaries of 16th century Ireland. Now, you guys might be celebrating the uh, Emerald Isle, but we think that Saffron Isle is a much more appropriate term, as you'll learn later on. Uh, but for now, allow me to do a bit of Shakespearean quotation. Uh, from Henry IV, the uncivil kern of Ireland are in arms. And from Macbeth, the multiplying villainies of nature do swarm upon him from the western isles of Kern and Galloglass is supplied. These two quotes from Shakespeare were not indicating something from the past, but in fact, modern news that Shakespeare himself was living through, indicating the weaponry and warriors of Ireland. And that's what we are here to talk about today. Uh, specifically, what Ireland was, who it was fighting, and the two most important soldier types of Ireland at the time. But we are going to start off with a little bit of a mundane bit of history. We are talking about clothing. And Natalie here is wearing some traditional Irish clothing, and we're going to answer why we think saffron is a more appropriate color than emerald for Ireland. So first of all, if you'll take a look, she is wearing the traditional garment of medieval and Renaissance Ireland called Elena. And it has some very identifying characteristics about it, namely these very long wing-like sleeves. Um, and it's very fascinating because they all have it. All the depictions we have of 16th century uh, Ireland that do depict it also have big long sleeves like that. And it in and of itself is an example of Irish history of this era overall. Because they have such large sleeves, we as modern historians don't actually have a reason why they had sleeves like that. It could have been tradition. Some people theorize they could store items in those sleeves. Uh, but the point is, this particular example of Irish archaeology and culture is representative of Irish history of this era overall. We don't have a lot of concrete evidence about Ireland uh, and the culture and the military culture that took place in it. Then what we do have comes mostly from the eyes of other nations, namely England, which may not have been the most reliable sources on Irish culture at the time, namely because they hated them. Barnaby Rich, an Englishman at the time, wrote, The very dross and scum of the country, the very hags of hell, fit for nothing for but for the gallows. He described the kern. So these are, that is one out of many examples of the English descriptions of uh, the, Irish, the traditional Irish <clears throat> and the kern that they, that they used, what that they uh, used in their armies as part of fighting. And we'll learn about the kern, or what I'm depicting, a gallow glass, as we move on. Uh, back to the, the, the garments, while the lena might be made out of a material called linen, uh, or flax, as we know it more common today, the outer garment, this blue one here, is actually uh, called an einer. The einer also has a very unique Irish design to it. Not necessarily always blue, whereas the lena was almost entirely always a saffron color, dyed with saffron, um, or similar color dye. Uh, 
the iron ore could have been multiple colors, usually another bright color. We have blue, there's also red, green, uh, and it was an outer garment that a Kern or even a traditional Irish garbed civilian would have worn uh, in any scenario possibly as a way to keep the weather uh, off of them if it was too cold or to protect themselves from you know, the brambles and briars of nature as they went on. Now, that is standard dress for a traditional Irishman, but when the Irish went to war, they were identified as Kern. And we mentioned the Kern earlier when we quoted Macbeth earlier, um, and that's what Natalie's depicting right now. The Kern were your standard, traditional Irish military force of the time. They were as Irish as you can get, as traditionally Irish as you can get, and they had some very unique military weapons. Uh, the first one we're going to talk about are these right here. This is your quintessential Irish kern weapon. Uh, these are darts or javelins. And wh why are we starting here with these darts and javelins? Well, it's because the kern traditionally fought in a skirmishing style. Uh, in fact, most of the English armies as they invaded Ireland at the time attempted to do large-scale battlefield uh, tactics against the Irish, and the Irish wouldn't partake. They wouldn't create a, a line of battle. They would simply skirmish uh, and pass through the English army with javelins or arrows or other thrown weapons, but mostly the javelins, and the English couldn't fight them because as soon as the Kern threw the javelins, maybe took out an Englishman or two, they would turn around and run back into the wilderness. Uh, so that was one of the biggest art, uh, complaints about the Irish when the English went to fight them. Now, if we take a close look at the heads here, I'm going to get a little closer to camera here, you can see that they have uh, barbs at the back of them. Now, this is frequently described uh, this is this is a very common description of the Irish Kern dart having these barbs in it. I think you can you can guess why they had the barbs uh, because if they were to penetrate someone's flesh, it would be incredibly difficult to uh, yank <laughs> difficult to yank that out as the barbs were pointing backwards. So that's a very traditional style. Um, of, of Irish arrowhead and javelin head. Now, one other thing to notice about these is uh, these unique little additions down here. They did not always have them, but when they did, and, when, and they were fairly common, they added such power to the throwing of a javelin. Um, javelins were used in skirmishing, as we mentioned before. Now, to explain what that means, as armies are coming together on the battlefield, usually you don't want the army to fight your army. You don't want the enemy army to be at 100% battle readiness as they come and fight your army. What you want is to send forth javelin, or I'm sorry, skirmishers, or in this case, kern, uh, as they commonly were used in Ireland, to be skirmishers. They would run ahead of the battle line, and they would hurl these javelins at the opposing forces and hopefully take out two or three of them. So instead of having your enemy forces ready and prepared to go, feeling invincible and strong, you want them feeling shaken. You want them feeling scared and worried. Their friend just got impaled by a javelin and you can't pull it out. They want it, they, you want them to be scared as well for when the actual clash happens. And the Irish were incredibly good at skirmishing, that was what they were specialized in. Uh, and we'll get to the other aspect, which is what I'm representing later on after we finish talking about Kern and Kern weaponry. So uh, back to these leather slings or thongs as they're referred to as, they are attached to the base of these javelins here, very securely. And the idea is they add extra force and power. So if I'm just simply throwing a javelin ignoring the leather, and I'm simply throwing it, I can only get so much force behind it. If you look at uh, the pivot point of my shoulder and how far out my arm can reach, and if you picture that as an arc uh, in, geom ge uh, in geometry, it only has so much power 
behind it. However, if I have the thong, and I use that when I'm throwing the dart, as I throw, as I'm throwing it, pretend my hand is not here, uh, I let go. And I still am propelling the dart forward with my finger as I'm throwing it, and it adds so much to the arc of that throw, it adds an incredible amount of power behind it, so much so that the javelin would possibly be able to puncture some armor. And we'll talk about the different varieties of armor later on, but nonetheless, you can tell that a javelin, a heavy javelin like this, would do a lot more damage than, for example, a bow and arrow from a distance because there's so much heft behind this, which is very fascinating. Uh, another thing, another weapon that was frequently used by the Kern is this. Here you go. That is a traditional Irish knife, very similar to the Scottish dirk, but in this case, it is called a skein. Uh, and the Irish would hold it in a very particular manner. And we know this from certain surviving images depicting Irish. And we're gonna, this goes hand in hand, no pun intended, with something else that we're gonna talk about in a second. So the Irish would hold their cur or their uh, skein up above their heads with the dagger point forward. And if they are fighting an opponent, if you imagine that opponent has a weapon against them, they need a way to defend themselves. And frequently, we see Kern, and this is very cool, I'm, I'm very fascinated by how they would do this, the Kern are depicted with having one gauntleted hand, possibly to protect themselves from an attacker, possibly to grab it, or to just intimidate it, thus freeing themselves to go in for the kill with their skin, uh, which is the concept of having one, just one, the left hand, being gauntleted, uh, which is, is such a, an iconic Irish thing. It's, it's very hardcore. Uh, and what, what is unique about it is that these guys, the Kern, are light infantry. And light infantry uh, are rarely depicted having armor because they need that speed to be able to move around the battlefield, to hurl their javelins, to run back and not engage in open conflict. Uh, but having a armored uh, arm, armored hand in this case, is a very fascinating and unique thing that the Irish kern would do. Now these kern, as they were uh, as they were running out and they were skirmishing, they were throwing their javelins and running back. They had battle cries of Paro and Ulla, and those are very fascinating too because uh, the English hated hearing Ulla. Um, and it actually led to the English word hubbub that we know today. So that is that is something that the Irish kern would have used. And uh, to, to finish this off, the Irish kern had it were, and I want to clarify this, this is the last remnant of a truly Irish military force uninfluenced un by other militaries or other nations or other cultures. Uh, now, we mentioned earlier that the English hated the Kern. Uh, and one of the, one of the bad de and poor depictions of the Kern came from their use and skill in skirmishing. As the English forces were marching through Ireland, through the bogs and through the woods, they would come across Kern uh, ambushes. And the Kern would jump out, throw their javelins, maybe do a little bit of knife fighting, and then get out of there and slink back into the uh, into the woods, into the bogs, and away from the places that the in the modern modern English armies couldn't follow them. And the Irish hated, or the uh, English hated that the Irish would do this, and they even started calling them wood kern, uh, implying that they lived in the woods and were somehow not a, a more uh, as civilized, to use a very archaic term. Uh, as the English, it was a very, it was almost a, an insult game that the English would use because they simply couldn't attack the Kern. The Kern would come and ambush them and then run away and there's nothing the English could do. Um, so the Kern became a staple part of Irish military forces. Now there's another half. There's a, there's a yin to the yang 
of the Irish military. And that is moi. Uh, I represent a Irish gallo glass. And the gallo glass have a very fascinating history. Originally, the gallo glass came from Scotland. And to point out, Scotland and Ireland at this time have a very linked history. They might not necessarily be helping each other out in their own independent rebellions or infighting uh, against the English or against other lords in Ireland and or Scotland, but they did have a shared culture, specifically the Celtic culture uh, and the Gaelic language. Uh, so, I, And I do want to clarify the Celts are a completely different people than these Celtic cultures of Scotland and Ireland. The Celts, uh, it's, a common, it's a common misconception I hear, the Celts are actually Germanic, and they were from the era of the Roman Empire. And as you get the uh, migration period, which is the, after the fall of Rome, but before the Viking Age, uh, the migration period, you have all these cultural groups transferring into different locations across Europe, and it just so happened that the Celts from the Germanic region migrated to various locations, such as Scotland and Ireland. And Scotland and Ireland are one of the few places where that culture remained and lingered, which is why we call the Renaissance and medieval era Ireland and Scotland Celtic cultures, but they are distinct from the Celts. Uh, just to clarify that common misconception. Back to, back to the gallo glass. Um, in the Viking age, the Vikings would come to Scotland and they would colonize, making different towns and trading settlements and fortifications in Scotland. And uh, they eventually became a common part of, they didn't leave, they stayed there. They became a part of Scottish culture. And that Scottish native culture and the Nordic culture fused together and out came the gallo glass. These were tough soldiers, big, tall soldiers. They were specifically chosen to be among the biggest and tallest soldiers there were. And as they became a, a part of Scottish culture, um, they became associated with particular clans. And in, in this period, in this case, the MacDonald clan and many others in particular would travel over and migrate to Ireland, bringing the gallo glass tradition with them in the 1300s. And so the gallo glass, first originating from Nordic settlers and then becoming a part of Scottish culture, are now traveling from Scotland to Ireland and becoming a part of Irish culture. And what is important about that is that while they didn't get along very well, the Kern represented a very important part of military tactics, the light infantry being mobile, being skirmishers, specializing in range and specializing in speed, whereas the gallo glass represented the other half of that, the heavy infantry. They were the ones who would not give ground. They would not retreat. They were the strength and the arm of the army. If they needed a job done, or they needed a location held, or they needed to take a particular location, the gallo glass were the ones who would be able to do that. And they used a lot of particular arms and armaments to be able to do that. If you'll take a look at what I'm wearing here, uh, this padded under jacket right here is called a gambeson. It is actually a piece of armor. Now, you might not think of armor being made out of fabric, uh, as very logical, but in fact, it actually is. Many, many, many layers of wool or linen uh, and leather sometimes intermixed with that would create a mobile and light, but yet very impenetrable piece of uh, armor. The other use that a gambeson had would to be going underneath and protecting the body and the bones from a much heavier piece of armor, the chainmail. Now, while I'm or mail, uh, as it's officially and truly called. Uh, chain mail is a modern term, uh, whereas mail, anything back in the day referred to as mail, would have been what we now know as chain mail. While I'm wearing this mantle of chain mail, a more appropriate uh, piece of armor would be <laughs> an entire 
chainmail suit, which is very heavy. And this would have been called a hauberk, uh, or sometimes a suit, or even we know it as a shirt of chainmail. And this is incredibly heavy, and it's no no doubt that the uh, heavy infantry or the gallows would have been needed to be incredibly tall, strong, and stout to be able to wear something like this and move around the battlefield. I'm going to put this down and we're going to talk about chainmail for a little bit more. Uh, one particular thing to notice, if you're more familiar with 16th century military, the century we're talking about, you'll know that it went through a concept called the military revolution, which changed warfare overall. Uh, one of the side effects of it is that armor changed. You start seeing fewer and fewer pieces of armor on the soldiers. Uh, and in particular, if there was armor, very rarely would you see simply chainmail or chainmail hauberk. That's a much more medieval or early era type of armor that phased out in exchange for plate armor. This is the type of armor that you might see on some of the English forces that came to attack Ireland in this era. Some of the Irish did have it, especially those that considered themselves Anglo-Norman, meaning uh, English families that came over in the original invasion of Ireland in the 13th uh, centuries uh, and kind of stuck with some lingering English traditions such as knights, uh, and they would have had plate armor, and the English would have had plate armor. But the native Irish forces, such as the Galaglass and the Kern, very rarely, if ever, are, associ are associated with wearing plate armor, uh, not counting the left-hand gauntlet of the Kern and occasionally a helmet. The difference being, this plate armor is very good at defending against all sorts of attacks, such as a javelin, can't break through it, or even a sword. Can't really do much to it. It was only until the advent uh, or the invention, or I suppose the innovation, um, of firearms, such as the arquebus, that you could puncture plate armor like that fairly easily. And of course, plate armor usually had a gamison and occasionally even chain mail underneath it as well. Now that is in opposed to in opposition to the gallow glass, which had a much more mobile, as in I can move freely even if I was wearing the hauberk, uh, rather than the plate armor, which you have to, unless it's very well fit and very well made, which most of the nobles were, uh, it's very heavy and bulky if you had to have a more standard arming version of a purist uh, plate armor chest plate. So nonetheless, uh, chain mail might not have the rigidity. I might still be able to feel when a sword hits me, but it is not able to cut me, and it's very good at preventing all sorts of ranged weapons from piercing very far beyond the rings of the mail. That's a little bit about the armor of the gallon glass, but it's really the weapons that make the gallon glass stand out. But before we get into the weapons, I do first need to tell you about a standard weapon. I'm going to have Natalie hold it here. This weapon is a pike, or in this case, it's actually a very short version of a pike. The standard pike would have been 16 to 24 feet long. Can you imagine that? That is a huge staff or spear, and it wasn't used in individual combat like you would think a sword and shield might be. It was actually developed to be used as a unit, a military formation of soldiers, frequently fresh and raw recruits, that would listen to the commands of an officer. And the officer would give commands like uh, order arms, shoulder arms. Uh, they would give commands like present arms. And, and all of these forces, and that has to be off screen because it's such a large thing, uh, all of these soldiers would have been attacking and moving together in unison, listening to the commands of the officer. That is how a pike 
was used on the battlefield in creating a pike wall or a pike square, basically an impenetrable porcupine of men and metal that was very difficult to get past, especially if it was supported with gunners or ranged soldiers of the time. So we talked about mercenaries. I want to explain what a mercenary is. Both the Kern and the Galloglass, not only did they fight in the wars against England and the infighting in Ireland, but they were also hired out as soldiers to the European nations, France, um, Germany, or the Holy Roman Empire. Uh, England actually hired quite a bit. And many of the other powers, Austria, um, Flanders, they would hire these soldiers to fight in these European style wars. Now, the fascinating thing is the wars that the Scots or the Galloglass and the Irish Kerns were used to was nothing like the mainland European forces using pikes and very more mechanical and uh, militaristic, more modern, if you will, styles of fighting. Those that we just described with the pike marching in formation, those soldiers were usually recruits. Well, what that, and this is as, a, as opposed to, for example, uh, certain other European mercenaries, the, the uh, Germanic Lanskinecht, for example, um, or the uh, Swiss Rieslaufer, were specialized professional soldiers. Most of the soldiers who were pikemen were farmers, merchants, or other sort of normal non-military people. They were recruits. They didn't really want to fight. They didn't make their living from fighting. And so what you get are European nations hiring Galloglass to come onto the battlefield and destroy these pike formations. Now, later on, Galloglass did get a bad rep. They said that they didn't take out pike formations very, very much as good as they wanted to, but they still used intimidation to a huge effect. Um, so we're going to put the pike down for a second, but we're going to come back to it in just a minute. But I first want to describe to you the classic Galloglass weapon, which is this. This is a battle axe. Now, this particular one is in the design of a Dane axe from the Viking Age. Might not be the most appropriate design for the 16th century, but it is something very similar, very akin to what these Galloglass would have fought with. A heavy battle axe that has more of an appropriate place on the medieval battlefield than the more modern 16th century. It's very intimidating, uh, especially if you are a plakeman and you are, you know, were a farmer three weeks ago and a recruiter put a pike in your hands and now it's all of a sudden you're a plakeman and you don't want to be. If you're on a battlefield or if you're uh, marching through the field on your way to a battle and you know there's enemies around, and all of a sudden over yonder mossy knoll comes a whole battle or company of these gallow glass wielding these giant two-handed axes yelling things like pharaoh and abu as you're charged as they're charging you and you're just waiting for the captain to say okay pull your pikes up okay come on and as they're getting closer as they're as they are scary you're realizing these are huge guys Giants, specially picked out from Ireland to be Galloglass, wielding weapons that didn't even belong on the Renaissance battlefield. They were so outdated because they were so barbaric. You're going to get scared. You're going to be intimidated. And you are going to suddenly start thinking, hmm, maybe it's a bit better if I drop my bike and run and run back home where I have my family and my things. And so the intimidation of these Galloglass was used to great effect uh, in terms of terrifying and intimidating other soldiers on the battlefield. But we're going to bring the pike back. What happens if maybe it's a more professional pike line or they're more used to it and they're not going to be scared? They're not going to run away. Well, in terms of 16th century battlefield tactics, uh, there was one question that every good military leader had to answer. And that question was, how do we get past the pipeline? Because assuming your pikemen aren't scared and they don't run away, 
you now have this impenetrable wall of spears. How do you get through it? How do you get past it? How do you get your soldiers to move them from their land that they're defending so that you can win? One of the answers was to use something called a great sword. And we have a couple examples right here. I'm going to fire one really quick. This is a great sword. Not just a great sword, but a great sword. This particular one is about uh, between five and a half and six feet tall here. Uh, and it is just massive, just gargantuan. This particular design is frequently referred to by modern uh, historians as a gallow glass sword. And its particular, its particular design is shown in period art by an artist known as Albrecht Dürer, who is uh, very popular. He drew a lot of uh, Flanders, Flemish peasants and stuff like that too. He actually drew Irish soldiers, and this particular sword is depicted on one of the gallow glass. So how it was used, uh, not just intimidation, just like the giant battle axe, but if there is a wall of pikes and I need to find out how to get past it, I'll be sending my gallow glass in forward because what they would do is they would swing these swords and we assume they would use their strongest muscles in their body, their core, with a big spin, or not spin, but a twist from their core, and the weight of the sword, the weight of that, would hit the pike or maybe multiple pikes and knock them all out of the way. Possibly another gallow glass right next to them would be attacking the opposite direction, and the force of those swords would keep those pikes out of the way, allowing an opening to be created in the pike line for other gallow glass to charge through. Now by doing that, you have broken the enemy pike line. They are scared, they are intimidated, they are running, and you have won the day using a great sword like this. Uh, I'm gonna hand this particular one to Natalie, and I'm gonna grab this one, and we're gonna do a little bit of a comparison. So, thank you. We've got two great swords here. This one is a replica of a Scottish claymore. This one is a replica of an Irish claymore. And you can see some of the differences on it. This particular one, the Scottish claymore, uh, while they don't all have what is called a scent stopper pommel, they'll sometimes have a ring uh, or disc pommel. Um, that does have some identifying characteristics of Scottish culture, and that would be the quatrefoil design here of the four almost cloverleaf uh, looking design here, and here at the end of the cross guards, and they also have the forward sloping cross guards or quillion or quillon uh, here on the sides. That is fascinating, uh, but there are some depictions of Irish swords uh, and we've got two replicas of Irish swords here today that have some very distinct Irish characteristics. Let me hold that one, please. So one thing, if you look at these two swords, and I have to angle this one because it's so tall, um, you will see the most identifying characteristic of these two swords is that their pommel has a hole in it. Now, traditionally, a sword pommel is supposed to be a very heavy piece of metal that acts as a counterbalance against the weight of the blade, allowing the sword to be more nimble and move more freely as you're trying to direct it at your opponent or parrying attacks, etc. But for whatever reason, and we know the Irish had these, we actually have surviving, uh, not only period depictions, but also actual archeological swords uh, that have been recovered that have a ring pommel as they're called. The only problem is we don't know why. We don't know why the Irish decided to have a ring pommel, especially because it's contradictory, theoretically, to the reasons why a sword even has a pommel in the first place, in this case being a counterweight. Because if you have a, a hole through it, you're removing most of the weight that would be used as the counterweight. So we don't really know why, or if there was a particular reason, there's no depictions in artwork or anything like that. Uh, and they, there's depictions in artwork of the ring pommel, but no depictions that might give a hint as to why uh, they would have a ring like this. So we have to assume 
it's probably tradition. Uh, there's a, so there's a few other identifying characteristics of Irish swords. And if you look at these cross guards or quillion or keon, um, they have a very iconic flared end to them. That's not something you see very commonly in other cultures. They usually just come to a little point, maybe a little decorative bead at the end. But the flared end, uh, especially this design here with the uh, the three spork, uh, fork looking uh, stickers out the end here is a very iconic Irish design for the swords. Um, and it's another thing where we just really appreciate that this is an Irish, a traditional Irish design uh, that we that doesn't get as much identity or identification in the modern era as it should. Uh, we always think of the, the Celtic knot and things like that, but I think the more iconic cross guards with the ring pommel are also a very iconic Irish design, and it should deserve more publicity. Um, so with that, uh, I did want to talk a little bit about weapons that the Irish would come against. Uh, and in this case, it would be specifically the English longbow. And this is a modern example or an old modern example, but nonetheless, the English longbow was still something that the Irish never were able to overcome. The, they, they had the heavy infantry with lots of chainmail, but even a longbow, an English longbow, would be able to puncture even chainmail when it was fully drawn back, especially if it had one of the more specialized points, such as the Bodkin point, on it uh, to puncture through usually plate armor, but just to have enough weight to do damage against chainmail. It's not something the Irish were really ever able to overcome, not until later. We'll get to that in just a minute. Um, there's a couple other uh, weaknesses to the Irish military that they weren't really able to overcome. One of them was that they never adopted artillery in any sort of major form. Artillery being cannon, uh, or sometimes mortars, howitzers, culverin, uh, other varieties of heavy guns, big, big guns mounted on wheels, or sometimes not mounted on wheels. Uh, the Irish just never really adopted it in any numbers. They even captured some from English armies when they were victorious on the battlefield, but they never utilize them. And frequently when we do hear artillery was used in Irish battles or battles on Ireland by non-English soldiers, it was usually by mercenaries or allies uh, from nations like Spain or Italy that were using the cannon rather than the Irish themselves. And that changes later on. We'll get to that in just a moment. Uh, and the other thing that the Irish didn't really succeed at uh, for the most part was having a significant cavalry force. Now, cavalry was still incredibly important to all battles at the time, all, all armies at the time. The Irish did have cavalry, don't, don't get me wrong, um, but utilizing them as a screening uh, tactic and also utilizing them uh, effectively on the battlefield was not really used uh, as commonly as, as the Irish soldiers really had a more of a focus on infantry, which would be the footmen, the current, and the galaglass. Uh, most of the cavalry, especially the armored knights of the traditional sense, came from what I mentioned earlier, the Anglo-Irish families, meaning these lords that came over to Ireland and settled there in the early 12 and 1300s. It's part of one, some of the earlier invasions of Ireland and attempts to colonize it. And they stayed there ever since, kind of lingering somewhere in the mid-between zone between an English culture and an Irish culture, uh, and a lot... and those families, those Anglo-Irish families, didn't get as much respect from the English, the truly English lords, and often they were kind of outcasts on both regards. Outcast from the Irish as being semi-English and proud of it, outcast by the English for being semi-Irish and being proud of it. Uh, nonetheless, they still contributed significantly to the Irish forces uh, against other Irish clans or against the English invaders as well. Uh, since many of them did go native uh, and, and, and adopt Irish cultures, customs, and traditions, uh, and thus would be seen as enemies of England. So all of this came to a, came to a culmination. Uh, and as we talked about with the gallow glass with their chain mail and the very medieval style of weaponry they used, as we talked about the kern with their javelins, 
not really adopting firearms or any modern weapons. This all came to a head with one of the final truly rebellious battle. I mean, there were plenty of rebellions afterwards, but the last rebellion, which was a bastion of true Irish, uh, truly Irish culture fighting against the English uh, at, without being meshed or fused with other cultures, came from uh, Hugh O'Neill, who was the Earl of Tyrone, who gave one of the greatest and strongest battles and, and attempts at fighting off the English and the English invasions in the Nine Years' War, also known as the Tyrone Rebellion. Now, Hugh O'Neill spent lots of time in the area known as the Pale. And the Pale was a region of Ireland where English lords ruled. And the English lords ruled uh, through not just direct appointments of appointing English lords to go rule there, or appointing local Irish lords that were loyal to England to administrative positions in there, but it was, it was essentially seen as a different nation by the Irish, or an uh, enemy land by the Irish. And Hugh O'Neill, spending time in the Pale, learned a lot about how the English military worked. And the English modernized, at least modernized much more than the Irish military did. Hugh O'Neill learned things like categorizing soldier sizes to a particular number instead of the earlier battles, which could have ranged anywhere from 35 to 150 soldiers. He tried to rigidly put companies of, at least on paper, 100 men into formation. He also adopted a lot of guns firearms, arquebuses, and muskets uh, into the Irish military, which in and of itself is a very fascinating aspect of Irish military. As the Irish adopted these guns, these firearms, muskets, and arquebuses, and uh, it, it can be a difficult thing to learn. Uh, nonetheless, one of the reasons that the gun was adopted into all European armies was because of its simplicity of use. You could give a gun to a soldier, give him two or three weeks of training, and he can be an expert marksman. <clears throat> Nonetheless, if it was to, if it was given to soldiers or troops that might not have never seen a gun before, such as the Irish Kern, there's a bit of a learning curve with it. Nonetheless, the English soldiers or, or some of the Irish who were associated with the English military were very proud of the Irish Kern for learning how to use guns, arquebuses, and muskets in such a rapid manner to such a point that they were comparable to the English marksmen in a matter of a year uh, of incorporating musketeers and arquebusiers into the Irish forces. Same can be said about the pikes. And we actually see images of Kern armed with pikes marching in formation, which is a, a kind of, must have been a very different thing to the Kern, uh, to march in formation and march with pikes, though they probably had the very familiar sounds of the Irish bagpipes. Uh, yes, they, Scott, Scotland is associated with bagpipes, but at this time, bagpipes were all over the place, Germany, and uh, especially in Ireland as well, as a military instrument. Uh, which probably brought them a little bit of joy as they attempted to walk in formation, which is something that they weren't used to doing in the past. Um, so through all of these efforts, oh, and, and I should point out that by the end of Hugh O'Neill's rebellion, uh, the Tyrone Rebellion, the Nine Years' War, uh, the Irish were praised by other forces as being comparable to mainland European nations as well. So they they essentially revolutionized and modernized their military and did it very well and very quickly. Um, I should also take this point to this time to point out that Ireland had a very powerful ally in Europe as well. And that came in the form of Spain. And if you know about 16th century history, Spain and the, the, uh, the, the empire behind it was incredibly powerful at this time. Uh, with the income that Spain was getting from colonies in the New World, uh, New Spain, New Mexico, um, all of the conquests that were going on, destroying, the, uh, destroying tons of cultures and civilizations in the New World, the Incans, the Mayans, the Aztecs, uh, various other uh, cultures as well being wiped out and uh, basically turned into slave civilizations – 
the Spanish coffers uh, were being incredibly full. They were getting gold sent over from the New World. They were conquering other lands. They had tributes coming in from all the other uh, colonies and, and uh, tribu tributary lands to the Spanish crown. Spain was incredibly powerful at this time. Uh, and it had a uh, pretty major rivalry with England as well. Uh, England was attempting to colonize the New World, though nowhere near as successfully as Spain did. Um, and Spain and England did have a very powerful trade network as well, especially with the Navy. So Spain and England were very heavy rivals. And while they did attempt to do direct warfare, uh, the Spanish Armada is the prime example. It was stopped beforehand. They used Ireland as a kind of pseudo battlefield, the Spanish would arm as best they could the Irish uh, in their wars and rebellions against England. They would give them all sorts of things, uh, European mainland swords, uh, arquebuses, which didn't take on very well, as we talked about before, armor such as, such as the iconic Morian helmet that you would see, um, as well as military tacticians uh, and all sorts of other uh, logistics and smiths to repair items, as well as giving a little bit of naval control over the sea to prevent England from doing too many naval uh, transportation to the, the other side of Ireland. So Spain was a very powerful ally, and it, came, it culminated in the Earl of Tyrone's rebellion, the Nine Years' War. It uh, finally came to a head at the Siege of Kinsale, uh, in which there was a coastal fortified town that the Spanish landed troops at and fortified this town. And the English, being so upset that the Spanish were supporting their Irish uh, underlings, as they saw them, went to besiege this Spanish-occupied, fortified Irish town, uh, or, or fortification, uh, and they went to besiege it. Spain wasn't worried. Uh, Spain knew that there were at least two major Irish clans with huge armies coming to their rescue. Uh, it was, on paper, supposed to be a perfect attack. The English army was going to be stuck between a rock and a hard place. They'd have the Spanish coming out of the uh, fortified town of Kinsale, and the two Irish armies coming and attacking England from the rear, and they would both just squish them together and basically force the Irish to break apart, or the English to break apart and, and flee. It didn't work out that way. The Spanish never left the town when the Irish attempt got close and attempted to attack the English. They just stayed there. Who knows why? Uh, and one of the two Irish clans never attacked. Only one of the Irish armies uh, so all three of these armies, the two Irish armies and the one Spanish army, outnumber the English army entirely. And if they had all worked together, the English army would have been destroyed. But only one of those three armies attacked, and it was outnumbered, and it got destroyed. It carried the brunt of the attack, fought valiantly, but at the end of the day, the English stayed, the Spanish were still besieged, and the Irish were now too weak to make any sort of counterattack. Um... So this essentially was the end of Hugh O'Neill's rebellion, the Tyrone Rebellion, the Nine Years' War. Uh, despite all of the modernization efforts that Hugh O'Neill brought to Ireland, pikes, which would later become a very iconic weapon uh, in some of the later rebellions, such as the 1798 Rebellion, um, became a very iconic weapon. Uh, despite all these, mod these modernizations, they still lost. Uh, and it was some of the infighting that actually led to it, as one of the Irish armies was from one clan, one of the Irish armies was from another clan. They didn't get along too well. They didn't really trust each other as much as they should have. Uh, so despite the modernization, it was still some of these old traditions that brought it down. Uh, Spain was no longer in any sort of position to assist Ireland directly. They didn't want to risk all-out war with England, and they got way too close at the Battle of Kinsale, the Siege of Kinsale. Uh, and it essentially brought the rebellion to an end. Um, that was the last attempt of traditional and uh, purely Irish rebellion against English uh, culture.
after the Earl of Tyrone rebellion, the Earl of Tyrone's rebellion failed, you get something called the Flight of the Earls. And all of these traditional Irish lords, uh, be them Anglo-Irish, be them truly Irish chieftains, they fled. They went to other places in Europe. They went to Scotland. Um, and only a few lingered here and there. Now, what happened was you got a power vacuum. These lords left. Their people stayed, but the lords left. And no one was there to really save the day or fight against the onslaught of the English. So the English, now in control of this land, for the most part, uh, just put loyal administrators in these former positions, and thus the control of Ireland and the lingering traditional Celtic, Gaelic, Irish culture gets phased out. Uh, and it comes to, it, uh, it, it turns into its own form of Irish culture, influenced by Scotland, influenced by now England, um, but the true Kern, the saffron uh, shirt, the, the Lena, the Einer, uh, and the Gaelic language, at least uh, to the most part, faded away. And so we, we now have a different Ireland being formed. And it, it, the end of the Earl of Tyrone's Rebellion and the, the, all of the action that went on afterwards in terms of changing of power revolutionizes Ireland. And we now get the more modern Irish that we know of today, a more industrious, uh, wool-organized um, culture that we see with a lot of influence of English country life uh, put in there. So with that, when we picture Ireland today, we don't picture a true, uh, pure Ireland. We picture an influence to, uh, with English tradition, with Scottish tradition, um, and we get the Emerald Isle. But when we picture the Saffron Isle, the true Irish Isle, the Celtic culture that came from the migration period, the Gaelic language, um, and truly living as Irish in Ireland before be, uh, purely, uh, this is the era that you think of. This is the last rebellion against that oncoming uh, onslaught, and it is one of the most fascinating, fascinating aspects of military history, Irish history, European history. It's such a great little snippet. Uh, you can learn more about this. There's plenty of books about it. Go to your local library, the Kent District Library. I like the plug. <laughs> um, and pick up some of the books there. And uh, if you have any questions, please comment on the video. I'll be monitoring it. Natalie will be monitoring it. And we'll be answering questions that you might have in the comments of the video. Um, and I hope you guys all have a very safe and happy uh, St. Patrick's Day. And enjoy and learn during the rest of Irish History Month. Again, this has been Jerry. Natalie. From the Swordsmanship Museum and Academy. Um, and I hope you all have a great rest of your month. I hope you guys enjoyed Jerry and Natalie's program tonight. Please take a moment to check out the events page on kdl.org uh, to see what other interesting programs, book clubs, and reading challenges we have in store for our patrons this coming season. Quick reminder that you have about three weeks left to turn in your Let It Snow reading checklists and to collect your complimentary mug. So I hope you all have a safe and finally warm evening. Thanks for joining us tonight.